see. I have to get all my stuff situated here. Well, it is really an honor to be here tonight with you. Uh, say hello to everybody who's watching on the live feed on the World Wide Web. We're using the web for the glory of God. Praise God. My grandfather, Jim Clark, is from Connecticut. Was raised on a dairy farm here in Connecticut. And uh, so I texted him earlier and said, I'm back in your old stomping grounds, preaching the gospel. And, uh, but it's good to be here in New London. I had a great flight over from Dallas, Texas, where uh, I'm currently living. I'm originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, home of the LSU Fighting Tigers. Go Tigers. And we're playing the Kentucky Wildcats tonight, so I'm binding up them Wildcats. <laughs> I'm claiming that the tigers shall have dominion over the cats. <laughs> it, it, if LSU wins tonight and Alabama loses, then I, I won't hear anything. But if LSU loses and Alabama wins, I'll probably have 50 texts when I get out of here. All these terrible Crimson Tide fans <laughs> heckling me about the tigers. If you've never been to Alabama, you don't know what it's like there. James, you were just there. It is crazy there. Yeah, roll tide. It's just they need deliverance. <laughs> I tell you, I, I came on. I, this was like the perfect week of the year to come. The leaves are all changing. It is beautiful. And uh, I don't know if you guys get used to it or what, but man, it is just gorgeous here. You can just feel the presence of God here in this amazing building that you guys have and the miracle that God's done as I was hearing some of the story. And uh, I've seen some pictures that James had sent me, but today when uh, Bob and I were driving up and we got in front, I was like, whoa. So I took a picture. I wanted to get a picture. I, I sent it to my wife. She said, boy, I love that building. She didn't know it was the church. <laughs> but it is a beautiful place, and the presence of God is here. And I'm just so thankful to uh, James and his beautiful family, and we got to be in their home earlier, and uh, Pastor Brian and his beautiful wife and uh, Miss Catherine and her beautiful daughters and family that are here and getting to know them and making some new friendships in the kingdom of God. And, you know, heaven is going to be an awesome place. We're going to have eternity to get to know the amazing people. You know, we'll just sit down for a million years and just fellowship about whatever, God's goodness, man. And then we'll go over and join the worship service, and then we'll talk and fellowship. And then there's going to be a fellowship hall. You know there's going to be some kind of <laughs> potluck or something up in heaven. <laughs> you know, there is the marriage. Somebody said, well, there's not going to be eating, e any eating in heaven. I said, well, what do you do with the marriage supper of the Lamb? If it wasn't going to be a supper, he wouldn't have called it a supper. We used to sing that song, come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. That means we're going to be eating something up there. And, you know, Cajuns from Louisiana think we're going to be eating crawfish etouffee up there. <laughs> but I don't think the Lord likes shellfish because he certainly said in his book, don't eat them. So I, I told him Cajuns, I said, I hate to tell you this, but I don't think they're going to be eating crawfish and boudin up there in heaven. God is good. He is good. How many of you know God is good? Oh, he's so good. Let's just pray. Lord, we just, we just thank you tonight for the rest and the peace that we feel in your house, God. When we come into your house, God, we feel at home. We feel refreshed. We feel secure. We feel blessed. We feel covered. We feel renewed. We feel restored. Lord, we thank you for the authority of Christ that puts a protective hedge around us. We thank you for the leadership that you've placed in this house, God, the pastors of this house. And, Lord, we thank you that they've laid down their life for the flock here, and they've given their life that this area might receive a renewal, a refreshing 
an awakening, God. We thank you that you have put it on their heart to hold this meeting, to awaken this whole area, God. And tonight, we don't just speak unto ourselves. We speak into the heavenlies, and we speak into a region, and we speak into this whole northeast of the United States, and we command the forces of darkness to begin to withdraw. And we begin to release heavenly angels, the principalities of heaven, that they would take dominion over the principalities of wickedness and rulers in high places. And we say tonight with force, God, your kingdom come, Jesus. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We engage heaven. We open a door and we release the windows of heaven into this region for your glory, God. For you said that the whole earth shall be covered as the waters cover the sea with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. And God, we just thank you for your glory tonight being resident in this place. We thank you that your glory, even as in Ezekiel 10, is spilling out of the doors of this tabernacle, out of this temple, into the streets and into the downtown and into the highways and byways of New London and into the surrounding areas. Your glory, God, will go forth and you will begin to take us like hot coals and begin to spread us about this region and we will begin to set ablaze this area with the glory of God and begin to burn with the fires of revival and that we would be like Samson's foxes and that our tails would be set on fire and we would run through the harvest fields of New England and set them ablaze with the glory of God. God, we thank you for what you're doing. We're so honored to be a part of it, Lord. We thank you for taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things. God, we thank you for taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. You know, we're, we're living in a day where God is birthing hunger inside of his people for the manifestation of his glory. And the last two years, I've had Habakkuk 2.14 that the whole earth would be filled as the waters cover the sea, with an awareness of the glory of God. I've sung about it. I've preached about it. I've prophesied about it. And it continues to be something that's very heavy on my heart. But I, I think that until the kingdom is revealed, the glory cannot shine. Until the kingdom is reestablished, the glory cannot come. Every time there was a full completion of obedience to the exact specifications that God gave, the glory showed up and no man could stand to minister. When Moses put the last piece in place in Exodus 40 of the tabernacle, every instrument, every piece of the furniture, every drape, every base, every, everything, every pole, every specification, the cloud came, and not a moment sooner, and it filled the, filled the tabernacle, and the priest could not stand. When Solomon had completed the plan that David, his father, had received, and he finished that massive project, a seven-year building project, the most expensive building that the world has ever seen and possibly ever will see, valued at a minimum of $500 billion. When Solomon dedicated that building and put everything in place, the glory came. And yet, thankfully, God 
manifests himself and touches his people and his anointing breaks the yoke, but we have not seen his glory in our day because we've not put the house back in order. The house is not in order and the kingdom is not being established in the hearts of God's people. And though we've got cleaner, nicer, more modern facilities than we've ever had, we have less glory than we've ever had. Because the hearts of the people are not established in the kingdom. And what God is doing, and even is doing in, in, in this meeting and by bringing these particular choice vessels here, is he's bringing and reestablishing apostolic authority that carries the DNA of the kingdom to say, hey, this is what the kingdom looks like. Now let's, let's grow this thing in this way. Let's build this thing on this foundation. We've tried this and we've tried that and we've had all the dressed up, spray painted, uh, Febreze wood, hay, and stubble that we can stand And now the Lord is bringing apostles and prophets along that says, hey, can we get back to the gold, silver, and precious stones of the kingdom that build a house that's glorious for the King of kings and the Lord of lords? And so God's raising up apostles. He's raising up prophets who are bringing this thing back into the New Testament DNA back to the kingdom, back to the foundation, cutting out every bit of fluff and every bit of flesh. God's not going to strive with flesh. God's not, gonna, he, he, God's not impressed with man's fluff. You know, and we got people running around making up numbers and exaggerating things and trying to impress people, but God's not impressed. Jesus sat there and watched them dumping in big buckets full of money. And then that one little widow came and dropped her little two mice. Jesus said, hey, she's giving more than everybody else. Because God's looking at the heart. And we, we, we've had such extremes in our country in reaction to different moves and different things. But God's saying, my kingdom is not a move. It is an entity. My kingdom is established through the principles of my word. And that's why the Lord is bringing back restoration of apostolic prophetic gifting to say, hey, the DNA is not right. We've missed the mark. We need to get back to the straight line. We need a plumb line that we can begin to build again on the chief cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus and him crucified. I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. I, I want to give you some examples of what I'm talking about tonight. I don't know how many of these we'll get to. There's several of them here. We'll go until we're done, and then when we're done, we'll be done. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Send your grain, verse 1, across the seas. And in time, profits will flow back to you. I, I'm going to give you tonight some things that one of them may really rock you. All four of them may pertain to you if I get to all four. But I, I want to illustrate what I'm talking about with you. Send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. Now, you have to understand that there are certain dynamics that we need to bring back into perspective. The Old Testament is way bigger than the New Testament. Isn't that right? And... A reason, one, one of the things that the Old Testament does is it reveals to us the kingdom. 
That doesn't mean the New Testament can't reveal the kingdom. But the Old Testament reveals the kingdom. And, and the Old Testament is so much bigger than the New Testament because the kingdom is way bigger than the church. And the New Testament reveals the church. The revelation of the church comes in the New Testament and because the kingdom is so much bigger than just the church. The church is a temporary entity that's established to reveal the kingdom in the earth realm. And so we have to understand its function in the kingdom. The church has a function in the kingdom. And the church right now is, is the government of God represented in the earth. It's the embassy of God. If you go to another nation, if you go to Mexico, there's a U.S. embassy. And when you're in that embassy, you're on U.S. soil. You can be in the middle of the capital of Mexico, but you're on U.S. soil and there's Marines there. And you cannot come in there unless you're authorized by the United States because that's United States territory. It's even subject to our law. And, and the church is that. When you come in this building, you're on kingdom property. Things operate differently in here because the kingdom is in operation here. And the laws of the kingdom are in operation in here. And as bad as the world wants to come into the church and try to make us follow their rules because we're in their country, we're in the kingdom when we're in here. And you cannot come in here and tell us that we have to endorse gay marriage in our kingdom because it is against the laws of our kingdom in this embassy. So the kingdom is revealed in the Old Testament the church is revealed in the New Testament. That's not an absolute. That's just a, just a picture. The prophetic, the prophets were highlighted in the Old Testament because prophets are primarily related and concerned with the king. And they speak for the kingdom. The New Testament, the messengers of the church are the apostles. The apostles establish the church. They carry the church. They provide the DNA, the covering, the leadership for the church. And together, they work together to establish the DNA of God's kingdom in the earth. Now, the first thing that's said here is send your grain across the seas. Send your grain across the seas. And I think the first thing that God is wanting to, to birth back into the church, it's not that we've never had it, we've had it for 2,000 years, but it's having to be rebirthed back into the church, is a heart for foreign missions. A heart for the nations. See, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say, stay and enjoy the worship. He didn't say, stay and enjoy the teaching. He said, go and make disciples. Now, that doesn't mean we all should just sh shut the doors of the church and all go to Africa right now. No. What it means is, is that the church should always have one eye on the nations. Where your heart is, there your treasure is also. And, and the church has lost a heart for the nations and has put its heart into its own interests. And that's why I travel around and I see churches that used to give millions to missions that now spend millions on interest to a bank for their brand new building that they spent ten times too much on to impress themselves in the community. Do we really need an $80 million building when, you know, years ago we had an opportunity, the Lord put it on my father's heart to uh, sponsor a Reinhard Bonnke crusade in Africa. It's $800,000. And dad said, if, some, if, if we get the money, we're going to do it. Well, it wasn't long after that, a man in our church got a million dollar bonus. And he gave a million dollars to our ministry. And so dad had said, if we get a million dollars, that's what we're going to do with it. 
So we took 800,000 and sponsored a bonky crusade. It was in Agoja, Nigeria. You know how many people got saved at that crusade? One million. One million people. Okay, so let's do the math here. $800,000, a million souls, that comes out to 80 cents a soul. You can't even buy a cold drink for that now. But a soul can be rescued from an eternity in hell for 80 cents. And yet, we forget about the nations. I have a good friend of mine in Dallas who's an evangelist who was raised up under Ron Harbonke, and he's going to win a million souls in the next three years. And you know what he can do that for? 90 cents a soul. 90 cents a soul. And you know, it's so easy for churches and us as individuals to want that nicer house and want that nicer car and another set of clothes and, you know, whatever it is. And there's nothing wrong with having nice things. We're not going to live under condemnation. But also, we've got to sin our grain. Our grain. Back then, they didn't have money. They had grain. That was currency. Send your money overseas. In other words, set your focus on the harvest of souls overseas. I'm going to tell you right now, uh, I go to the chiropractor every week, and uh, he, he works on me and crack and stuff pops in my neck, and oh, it's crazy. <laughs> and the other day, I, I went in there. I come out of there like, and the other day I went in there, and my wife was waiting on me. She sat in the car, and she was facing the door. And when I came out of the door, I walked like this. I was like. <laughs> She's like, what did he do to you? We all need realignment with this mission of the church. I had the opportunity recently to be with a, a minister from India, 38 years old. He's been beaten eight times for the gospel and tortured. If he takes his shirt off, he's got scars from being tortured and beaten in India for the gospel. 1.2 billion people in that nation. Just that nation. That means if you were a billionaire, if you had a billion dollars, you could give every person in India one dollar and you would be broke. That's unbelievable. And every one of them is a soul that Jesus died for. That has an eternity. And God wants to bring the kingdom back. This gospel is a going gospel. The first two letters of the gospel are go. Go spell. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. Send your grain across the seas. He said, and in due time, prophets will return. Now, what is that talking about? That's not, and we could use this in different contexts, but in that context, you're not going to see the prophets of that type of giving until you get to heaven. About, oh, it's been 12, 13 years ago, uh, my father st had started a church planning movement in 2000. We began planting churches around the world. And my brother and I really got a heart for China. We were living together. We were both single at that time. We began planting churches in China. Now, I've never been to China. And the Lord just put China on our heart. We have an apostolic leader there who plants churches there. And so we started planting these churches. And for a couple of thousand dollars, you could support a pastor for one year until the church was up and running. So we were planning these churches, and you could do them in villages, mid-sized cities, or big cities. And a mid-sized city in China is two million. Well, they got a billion people there. And between China and India, you're talking about 2.3 billion people, which is unbelievable. It's basically one-third of the population of the earth lives in China and India. Is that, I mean, that's just amazing. And I remember we, 
we were planning these churches and our apostolic leader from there came to visit and he, he opened up a sheet and he gave me a sheet of paper and it has some statistics on it. And I said, what's this? He said, this is the, one of the churches that you planted. It was two years old. It had 5,000 Chinese in it. I have never been there. Who knows how big it is now? And one day I'll get to heaven. And those prophets, they're going to come back to me in a way that money never could. Now, I'm here to tell you, you get to world missions, God is going to bless you. When he sees you're faithful to sow into the harvest, when he sees that he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. I don't know if you got that or not. If he sees you won't just take it and go, oh, I'm blessed, but say, hey, this is through me. When you become a channel, God begins to open the floodgates. 